All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm to be a sample. I, I will be giving this lecture and the one on Thursday because uh, Burkhard Ross is currently traveling in Brazil, as far as I know. Uh, so my uh, topic both times will be the homology-based prediction of protein function. Um, I will give you a very extensive introduction in the beginning and then uh, pick up speed a little bit towards the end. So, um, uh, so things are progressing slow in computational biology uh, on molecular biology in general. So Google just recently started a, a new big research project uh, and it's going genetics, but uh, so far things haven't really changed. Um, what you know, what you should know from, from school is the, is the following. So you, you should have basically uh, learned, uh, should have had two, two different topics. One time you, um, you would have learned top-down top approaches, so going from the human body to different organs, to different compartments of organs, finally to the, to the cellular level. And in another topic, you, 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 you go bottom up, you learn about DNA and how it is translated and transcri uh, how it's transcribed and translated to, to proteins. And this, this lecture is, a, is basically about this error right here. So the first step after you have sequenced your protein and uh, now want to know what it, what it actually does. And uh, you also notice if you do a, a little bit of math, this, the, 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 the gap in the, in, the, in the scalings. So one, one nanometer means that, that you have uh, 10 uh, hydrogen atoms in a row. So this is the diameter of DNA. The average protein is, a, is about two, two, two nanometers uh, in, in diameter. Then you, you go to the, to the cellular level and suddenly you, you're on the scale of, 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 of micrometers. So the average diameter of the cell is, is 10 micrometers. And you, you, you notice that uh, you can fit 100 billion proteins, hypothetically, into one protein. Obviously, there aren't that many proteins in the cell, but it's still a lot of space for a lot of things to happen. And essentially, we don't know how these proteins act together in order to build, uh, in order to, to, to to conduct the, the processes that are going on in the in the cell, what we ideally want to wanted to have is the following. Is this is this is this is a, a video of uh, trans transcription and translation. Um, it's three minutes long. I will, I will skip a little bit of it. Together around the RNA to form a miniature factory called a as a result, our muscles, brain, so and this all is basically one, one protein in the making. The they need. And uh, let's just say, so in this case, let's, let's just say this is, this is, this is an, an, an ATPase, so the ATPase would then uh, be part of, a, of another bigger complex and bind to other proteins that you that you see here. So, to, so, so different colors indicate different proteins. And uh, this is one of the best studied organisms, uh, best studied complexes that we know. The the, the ATPA. So it, it uh, catalyzes the reaction of of AD, of the uh, ATP synthesis. So it catalyzes the reaction ATP to to ATP. And uh, which are which is basically the the energy currency in in in, in our body. And again, so this this would be the the ideal, but uh, we we are far away from it to, to, to have it for for, for for every complex that there is. So for for far less than one per, one percent of all complexes, we have that that level of detail. And uh, a misperception a misperception that that uh, that is already encountered is that once we know the structure of the protein, we immediately know what it does and know all the details and can predict exactly what it what it does in the, in the end. So I. I don't, I'm, probably some of you already have had le lectures about uh, um, molecular dynamics, or a number of professors give, give these lectures. So, the, 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 but, but for those who haven't, so the, the molecular dynamics basically means that you that you that you simulate each atom, for example, in a in a protein according to the uh, um, exact physical constraints. 
and uh, if I say exact physical constraints, this is already and this is already wrong because uh, the really the exact behavior of an atom is extremely hard to predict. And what current methods actually do is, is already so the, the force fields they are using, the the, the energy, the, the the way that they they calculate the energy is already uh, quite an abstraction of reality. And what you see here might actually not be correct. And uh, if you and, and even if you take a, a very small grid here of atoms, you, you see that uh, only simulating the impact of one atom um, will be quite complex if you if you if you go over time and, 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 and wanted to know the behavior of all the other other atoms. So you have you have a, a simulation in, in picoseconds. This means a millionth of a millionth of a second. Um, for proteins, we, we reach to the level of, 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 of microseconds, so typically the average molecular d d dynamic simulation is in, on the order of microseconds, which means a millionth of a second. And if you compare this to, to processes like uh, Ebola incubation period, for, ex for, for example, with 21 days, you see that we are nowhere near, uh, uh, nowhere near realistic apl application for that for, for really uh, more sophisticated processes. Um, also, things are really going slow experimentally. So, this, so what, when do you think this, this, this picture was taken? Any, any guesses? So this, is, this, is a, this is a protein. The 60s, maybe. That's very accurate, yes. Um, so I, I guess the, this, this, this black and white is sort of uh, revealing. And this is actually not a, not a, not a picture of a protein, but, it's, but somebody has built a, a plastic model of a protein and taken a photograph of it and then put, put it in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the journal because they, they simply had no way to, to visualize it in any other way. So this is, this is 1965. So, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lysosome, I think. And, uh, and we have uh, 20,000 different proteins in our body. And by, by now, 50 years later, we only know the structure for around a quarter of them. So it's really slow. And uh, also, if you, if you wanted to have like a, a real world Im 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 impression where, where current knowledge ends, it is, it is quite easy. So this is also a transition then to the sorry, to the to the actual topic. So I, I chose the uh, sweating because it is simply the most simple process that I could think of. So heat comes, water flows. This can't be so complicated. You would you would think. So if you go to Wikipedia, pers perspiration is the scientific term for, for sweating. Uh, you see, it's the production of fluids secreted by the sweat glands. So I assume that we have no knowledge of the details of how uh, the brain actually um, notices that he heat is going up because we have only very limited details about the exact processes in the brain. So I will just assume that uh, the signal already travels from your brain to your to your skin, and uh, so the receiving end is really the sweat gland here. So I've already opened it, this link because my internet connection here is rather bad. Um, the mechanism of the of the sweat gland. You can find it here under under stimuli thermal. So there are two types of sweat glands: acrine, apocrine. Um, an acrine sweat gland stimulation occurs via activation by acetylcholine, which binds to the gland's muscarinic receptors. So muscarinic receptors, this sounds like a protein, and in fact it is. There are five types of uh, muscarinic receptors. The one that we are interested in is this one here, M1. Uh, the corresponding gene is CHRM1. If you look this one up, uh, you will find it. Uh, you will find it here in this database, and then you would ideally, if you if, if you really wanted to know the molecular details of this of this whole whole process, you would then go to to Uniprot, and this is where it ends. Yes. 
Okay. Uh, let's just skip this. Uh, so, okay. So in in Unipro, then I'm sure you all know it. You would then find out that um, there is no structure for this protein. So even for a, a simple process like sweating, you quickly hit the edge of, of, of what we know. And uh, as I said, so limitations in this field, devices, extra metal speed, noise, costs, and computing power, and uh, I'm sure you've all heard. Okay, so let's get to the to the to a, a possible solution to this problem, and you will find many different uh, way, uh, uh, different aspects of this and different ways of solution throughout the, the, the whole lecture, basically. So last week you heard uh, about some, th some things you can you can do with with Cyblast. I'm sure you're all familiar with with, with Blast. So you, you search for sequences in large databases of sequences. Um, what you can then, for example, do is for an unknown protein where you only know the sequence, you look for, you, you, you blast it through a database, for example, like, like Uniprot, and you, uh, you look for the, for the first protein that is similar to the one that, you, that, that you're looking for and to the, for the, and, and to the, for, the, for example, the EC annotation of this most similar protein. And then you, if you find a, a good enough fit, you can simply say, well, this is so similar that I assume that it has the same catalytic activity as, as my, my, my query protein. And if you do that, you uh, quickly find out that the, the accuracy of this type of prediction really depends on the similarity between the target and the template as shown, for example, as shown in the last week here on the, uh, in a graph like, like on the right. So you see that, it, that for about, at about 80% uh, sequence identity and above the prediction is quite accurate, but then quickly drops for for other uh, for, for 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 lower identities. Similar things are true for the prediction of localization, or whether the protein is, uh, is 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 controlling the cell cycle or not. And um, so, question is now: what what can you do if you do not have uh, a close homolog. And uh, in, in this case, you will learn in, in subsequent lecture about uh, prediction by for for distance, so-called distant homology, for example, by the by the means of, of like by cutting proteins into domains by using motifs for predictions or by encoding the protein in feature vectors and then performing machine learning. All right. Um, Yes, but uh, yeah, let's let's stick with this uh, with this very most simple way of, of predicting by simply taking the, the first hit. So we wanted to to take this one step further in the context of a, of an exercise. So 2010, 2011. So this was basically one of the, the first lectures held here at the at the TUM by by Professor Rost. I was one of the exercise supervisors, and we simply wanted to uh, make students implement simple function predictors. Um, which extend a little bit on, on, on this principle of only taking the first hit and then transferring the function. So we had 16 students, they were split into, into the three groups and each group was supposed to then implement their, their own function predictor. Um, to this end, we of course not only had to have the sequences and the annotations, but also we had to, to define what we actually want to predict. So we had to define what is, what is a protein function. This is a, a rather ill-defined thing. Uh, so there, there are many different aspects to it, as you already heard. Uh, but uh, one of the best ways of, of annotating protein function is really the, the gene ontology. Um, this is a, a very controlled uh, vocabulary for, for, anno uh, for annotations. It consists of basically three, three parts. So ideally, if you would have, if you wanted to have all the annotations for a protein, you would have three types of annotations. One time, what it actually does, so the reactions uh, that it is uh, that it is uh, uh, performing, for example, the the biological processes in which these reactions occur. Finally, where the protein actually resides within the cell. Uh, 
We have actually something similar here in, 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 in Munich in, in Weinstephan, I believe, but this is sort of fading out. So, so the, 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 the genotology is really taking over or on, a, on, a, on a worldwide level. And uh, yeah, if you if you wanted to to, to visualize this again a little, little bit, so again for the with the example that I've that I've shown before. Uh, for, 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 for this complex, for example, take one protein of this, of this complex, then you would have an annotation binding ADP and uh, uh, transferring it to, to, to ATP in the molecular function ontology. This all would occur in the context of ATP, ATP synthesis as the biological process. Uh, and the complex would then would reside in the in the mitochondrion as as the annotation in the sub in the cellular component nosology. Another uh, actual real world example now the the, the uh, human hemoglobin subunit alpha, so the protein that uh, carries the oxygen in in the body. You have. Uh, Ideally, so this is a very well-studied protein, one of the best-studied proteins that we that we have. You have in the in the in the full annotation, you have three distinct subgraphs, so they are all separated here. There is no connections between them. Uh, at the at the very root, you have the biological process, the cellular component, and the molecular function. Uh, the direct children of these root terms are very, very generic descriptions of functions, so biological regulation, the cell as the, as the component, and at, antioxidant activity, for example, as the, as the molecular function. And as you go down this, this hierarchy, the, the terms become more and more specific until you have, for example, something like bicarb bicarbonate transport at the leaf. And yeah, the, the, as I said, so the, the, the principle is basically that you, uh, the, so the underlying assumption is, uh, is, is that uh, you ex extremely often find very, very close homologs for, 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 for proteins, and if you're lucky, they're already an annotated. Um, right, so we, have, we now know what we actually want to predict, namely the genotology terms. Now, how do we do that? So as I've already mentioned a couple of times, so you, you blast a query protein against uh, an annotated uh, sequence database, in, in, in this case Swissprot, so Swissprot is a database of the most reliably aligned, uh, the most re reliably annotated protein information that we have, everything in there is manually annotated. And you uh, then can transfer, so if you, if, you, if you do this, you ideally get similar hits back. So similar, you will find similar proteins that are to your to your to your query. Then you you go on, for example, by so I will now switch to a more machine learning oriented uh, vocabulary. You you you, you do a, a, a one nearest neighbor prediction. This is what I just explained. So you simply take the top hit, or you you consider the the first k hits. Uh, or you go even one step further by by weighting the hits in in some way. And yeah, so this was basically all the instructions that the that the, that the students had. Uh, they should all follow these these basic uh, steps. And in the end, we we got three three methods back. So they had about two month two month time for all this. Um, first group was. Uh, uh, Composed of Ariane Böhn, Tatjana Braun, Rebecca Kassner, Cedric Landerer, Janik Malich. They implemented a, a sixth nearest neighbor. Uh, so there are a, a, a few magic numbers here, but so I, I don't know how they came up, came up with the numbers, but apparently they, they worked quite well in the end. Uh, they considered the hit count and the E value of each term. Uh, they output exactly three terms per ontology, so three different functions for, for, for each ontology, and, and they only use three different scores. And so how exactly does their, their method work? So if you have for one query protein, for example, six, so, uh, so you only look at the six best hits for your, for your query protein, and then you assign three different scores in the following way. So if one go term occurs in all of the six hits, that gets a score of 1.0. If it, if, it, if it occurs in less than, than, than six, but at, at least one, it is assigned a score of 0.5, and all the other cases are, are simply zero. And in the end, uh, in order to not make, the, make similar predictions too often, they also redundancy reduce the 
resulting in hierarchy uh, a little bit so, so that they really have only three terms in the end. Uh, second method is uh, uh, quite more, quite a bit more sophisticated. Uh, members are, were Mark, members of this group were Mark Heron, Thomas Hopf, Stephanie Kaufmann, Dennis Kompas, Stefan Seemeyer. They implemented a, a weighted k-nearest neighbor. They, uh, with a with a very sophisticated continuous scoring scheme, uh, that uh, incorporated the, the hit count, so the, the the number of goal terms among all the hits that they got, the the e value. The, the structure and, and even the structure of the ontology, they normalized the scores so that they were comparable within the same prediction and across different proteins and they optimized all their three parameters. Again, the method in a little bit more detail. So you will start here with a, with a, with a number of, of similar proteins. The first thing that you do is you somehow compile a score that reflects how, how well your overall result was that you got back from, from, from BLAST. For that, um, they took the logarithms of all the hits that they, that they of, of the e values of all the hits that they got. Uh, they took the average and, th and the standard deviation um, and some, some both up. And they repeated this for a couple of of, 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 of hundred training proteins, and uh, in the end got a Gaussian curve for this. So, the, uh, and we're now able for new proteins to uh, repeat this and then look up the this raw template score in this Gaussian distribution, and in this way convert this this raw template score to a into a range from 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 O to one. And it sort of then reflects again how well your your overall re results are. Of course, uh, you also need to score each goal term individually in the end. And to this end, they associated each goal term that they found among the hits with its its e values. So, for example, goal term four was uh, let's assume goal term four occurred four times among all all of our hits uh, occurred two times. Sorry. Um, so you associate this goal term with two e values. You again take the take the logarithms of these e values and uh, sum sum them up. This way you you get a, a score for for each goal term that you have in your in your in your overall results. And you you then uh, calculate also the the score of the of the of the root term, um, which is naturally yeah, which is naturally the the maximum of all, and you simply divide all the all the scores by this by this maximum, and in this way you can have the score in a in a, in a range from 0 to 1. And uh, one further correction step is that you you take the average over this. This over each each branch here, and this apparently also also helped. And um, in the end, you simply multiply the two scores, so you you weight each single uh, goal term prediction by the overall template quality, and in this way you get uh, scores for each goal term that is also comparable to other predictions for other proteins. Okay. Finally, last group uh, it was conceptually quite similar to the to the to the to the second one that you that you just heard. Members were Dominic Aachen, Florian Auer, Maximilian Necht, Peter Hünigschmidt, Michael Keeling, and, and Manfred Roos. Uh, again, weighted e value based nearest neighbor with a, with a custom scoring scheme um, and continuous ter term scores. There, so they did not calculate an, an overall uh, template quality score, but two single scores that uh, that rate the prediction of of, of each goal term in a in a different way. In the first score, uh, you sim simply look at the percentage positives. So, per so percentage positives is is the the identity of the amino acids that have uh, a positive substitution score in the Blossom matrix, but so this is, sounds quite complicated, but it's, this is in fact very similar to sequence identity. So simply think, uh, think of this as sequence identity. Uh, so you uh, can associate each go term 
of, of all the Gaussians that you, that you find with the, with the maximum sequence identity of all the hits. Mm. And this is a very, very simple trick to really to immediately have a score that is, that is normalized in a range between O and, uh, o and 1. Secondly, they, similar to the, to, the, to the first method, they associate each go term by the number of hits, by the, by the number of proteins this go term is associated with in your, in your, in your BLAST output. So for example, one go term could be associated with, 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 with two proteins, the other one with three, and one, and so on. And obviously, you can again uh, normalize this into a range of 0.1 by simply dividing each, each hit count by the maximum, which is the number of all the proteins that you found. And in the end, they multiply the two scores to have uh, one, one final score that they, that they output. Okay, any questions about these methods so far? No? Okay. So, uh, then go on, let's, then let's go on. Uh, you so you, you have the methods, you have the predictions, now you want to know how well the methods actually do. And uh, for this, you need to somehow find a way to assess the, the, the predictions uh, with go terms. So let's assume you, you predicted protein A uh, and you have the experimental annotations here of protein A on the left and the predicted annotation on the right. So, so you can ignore the leaf terms here for now. Just look at the green predicted curve. And one way to find out how well your method, method did is for, is for example by first of all looking only at the most reliably predicted terms, which are, let's say, open, uh, open 8 here and open 8, eight, eight here. So you see that uh, this one here, this term here, is actually a correct prediction because it also occurs in the exp ex experimental annotation. So this is a true positive. You have a predicted code term here uh, on the left that is not part of the experimental prediction. So this is a, a false positive. And there are quite a number of terms here that you, are, that you are missing, which are false negatives. And by having true positives, false positives, false negatives, you can calculate something called precision and recall. So uh, recall is simply the fraction of, of all the experimental annotations that you uh, find in your prediction. In this case, this is the, the we have one true, po so one, one is recovered here. Uh, and out of a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So one, one by eleven. Uh, so let's let's just say ten, uh, ten percent. So ten percent recall. And how how accurate is your prediction? So how how precise is your prediction? You 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 predicted two terms, namely this one and that one. One of the two was correct. Yeah. Bless you. Uh, and. Uh, this means one one by two fifty percent precision. So, in this example that I uh, that I just explained, you would have a recall of o, of 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 zero point one and a precision of zero point five. And then you you change the threshold, for example, to zero point seven, and you repeat all this. You get your 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 next point on the curve, and then you go go on and on until you cover the the, the full range of all possible thresholds, and you get finally a curve for your for your protein, you do this for for all the, the 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 proteins that you want to evaluate. You get various different curves uh, for different proteins, and uh, in order to, to have them one final curve, you simply average over over all the the precision values. And uh, often people also want to boil down. Uh, the performance of your method to one one number, and one way to to do this for recall precision curves is, is to take the maximum so-called maximum F1 score, which you can think of as a as a as the the maximum harmonic mean of the of the entire curve. So so you you, you look at each individual point, you calculate you some, some some sort of mean, and you simply take the the, the best mean of the of the entire curve. Okay, 
Uh, was was that clear or so? Any questions? No. Uh, all right. So we have your predictions. You know how to evaluate the the predictions. Now you you actually do do you actually put it all together. Uh, we we in, in our case picked. 10,000 random proteins from SwissProt that we simply called our, our targets. We, d we told the students, or actually we did this ourselves, so, we've, uh, so we, we, we used uh, all, all the rest of SwissProt as the templates. And uh, we performed two, two, two different evaluations, so not, not, not all the methods uh, made predictions uh, for all the proteins. Some of them left some proteins out. So. Um, we performed two different evaluations, one on targets for which all the methods made, uh, made predictions have some sort of, of uh, comparison on the, on the same data set, but in the second evaluation we also considered that the fraction of, of, the, of the proteins that were not predicted by penalizing each unpredicted target by a recall value of 0.0, .0 in, the, in the averaging of the, of the, of the curves. And this is what we, what we got out in the end. Um, so we have method A here, uh, not covering a, uh, a lot of recall, but still performing. So, so for the for the few scores that it calculates, it it performs much much better than, uh, or at least a little bit better than than the other methods. Uh, you have method B, which covers uh, a rather high recall range, but rather but with with rather low precision and quite complementary. Method C covering uh, low recall, but with a very high precision, and also a random predictor which which simply scores each go term according to the frequency it occurs in in SwissProt uh, already can achieve quite quite high precisions, indicating that you have some go terms which are just super frequent, and that basically every annotation in SwissProt has. And also, you see that there is not much difference between. Uh, taking all the targets or only the common targets so that there is basically no, no systematic uh, abstention of methods from, from, from certain proteins. So as a summary of the, uh, of the exercises, the, the, the implementations were quite, quite hasty, so the students did not have, uh, have a lot of time and uh, did not have a lot of time to, to learn about the, the genetology and, and everything so surrounding it, but, but still, so what we, what we got back looked very, very promising. The, the technical details matter. So, as computer scientists, you say this is quite quite obvious that if you if you have only slightly different implementations, that they will perform quite differently. But if you go to the biological level, so the 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 methods are built upon the same hypothesis. So you would not expect too much difference, actually, in terms of of of, of accuracy be, um, between them. Um, and finally, so the, the, the random predictor is actually quite quite good, actually almost almost too good, uh, so that um, we may so this is this may be either a, a problem of our methods, but also could also be, be due to the to the measure that we that, that we were using. Um, all right. Okay. So uh, another coincidence. I, I, I admit is that shortly after the exercises there was the so-called CAFA meeting. Uh, CAFA is uh, 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 quite quite similar to the to, to the CASP experiment, so for for structure prediction. Um, but so far it had not existed for function prediction. So this was actually the, the first uh, really critical assessment of function prediction uh, on a on a on a on a large scale. And uh, as with CASP, so the the great goal was uh, to really uh, assess all the methods, all the function predictors out there in the in the uh, in, in the world. So all the all the state of the art, and, and really use use everything that we have. And uh, yeah, and it, so if you if you spend a little time in the field, you will you will you will and, and read. Read of the literature, you will you will see that there are there are tons of different predictors, but the big problem really is that they all use different data sets with different features. Uh, they they predict different targets, so so and so and so not, not, not all proteins, but maybe only proteins from a certain family. They use different ways of of 
evaluating it all and have different strengths and weaknesses. For example, one is very fast, the other one is very accurate, and so on and so forth. And you can, you can interpret, this, interpret this picture a little bit like, like uh, uh, taming the beasts, so both of function prediction and of the predictors, the people them, themselves. So, again, so this is sort of the, the background why, why, why this, this, this whole thing was started. So you have here a quite an um, um, impressive collection of professors. So Merkel Bur was here, but all the ones, also other ones, they are all come from, from very uh, highly renowned uh, colleges. So you have Princeton here, Oxford, Indiana, uh, and so on. Uh, so quite an um, um, impressive audience also then in, in the meetings that were then had been held um, after after this 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 this, this whole assessment, and uh, yeah, I will I will now explain how in, in a little bit more detail how how this this uh, this critical assessment was was conducted. So first of all, you have to find people which 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 really organize everything. Um, secondly, you have to agree. On the functions that you finally want to predict, again, we use the the gene ontology, but the, but the, but in the process of of uh, of organization and really figuring out the details, we stumble upon quite a few hurdles. So the gene ontology basically is not as simple as it might look. So, for example, um, you have different types of relation. So a term. Uh, uh, an, an, an edge between two terms can have, can have different labels. It, it can be an is a relation, part of a relation, has part, regulates, and so on and so forth. And um, so that we needed to, to simplify that or yeah, come, come up with, with the rules how to, how to handle this. Luckily, the gene ontology itself already defines a few uh, so called path inference rules. So this means if you have one go term A, another go term B, another go term C, and different types of edge labels between them, then the gene ontology defines uh, whether A is actually also a, uh, a, 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 a subterm of, of C. And this might not always be the case, and it, uh, again it depends on the on the exact labels of the of the edges. You have finally different different evidence codes. This was also what we had uh, not considered so far. So, uh, depending on the type of experiment that was used to do the annotation, the the ex ex experimenter is supposed to assign different different evidence code to the to the annotation. So you have, for example, infer from sequence alignment. Which is which should not be very accurate, but you have also, uh, for example, much much more accurate annotations. For example, from inferred from 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 mutant phenotypes. So you uh, change one amino acid and see if the function. So you see 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 what happens then if some sort of process is uh, is stopped in the in the cell and then infer an inferred function. And finally, you have a large class. IEA, which means inferred from electronic annotation. So this means that a lot of the annotation in the databases that you that you find are actually IEA, which which means they are actually predictions. So just ju just the same thing that that we want to assess. So we we have to definitely ignore all the annotations that are annotated with with, with IEA. Um, the annotations can have different qualifiers. So um, for example, uh, an annotation can be um, kind of a, a, a not annotations. This means that the protein does not have the function, which uh, immediately brings you into a to totally different field, namely the so-called so anti so, so anti annotations. So we we may know no we we may know what a protein actually does, but we may not know what it not does. So, and in order to find that out, hypothetically, you would have to scan each protein for all the goal terms that you have, and really make sure that, that, that the protein does not have this goal term, which immediately, basically, uh, yeah, brings this whole level to, to another uh, order of, 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 of difficulty. But this is, this is absolutely unresolved. So for, for now, we only uh, deal with, with really actual positive annotations. Finally, uh, 
the Go, so the gene ontology itself is evolving. There are terms coming, terms going. So you have to agree on some sort of common uh, vocabulary. And uh, also the Go is, is, is rather a, a collection from, 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 from different databases, from different an annotation teams. And uh, yeah, you have to also come out, so some uh, agree on some sort of standards. So SwissProt does annotations, Go does on, on many annotations, and finally the Go, the Go A project, which is basically the EBI in, 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 in the UK, and they, they're also doing annotations. So what we've then finally decided that uh, upon is that we, we uh, ignored the different types of relations now and really only have one edge label, namely that, uh, which, which means basically that if there is an edge, then this term is uh, simply a more specific variant of the, of, of the parent. We, we are only using the following experimental evidence codes and uh, simply ignore all the other annotations. So these are really the, the most reliable codes that you that you can pick. Um, we agreed on on the on, on, on a Go version, is simply one one version of the uh, of the whole database, and again as SwissProt as our an, an annotation resource. And. Uh, Finally, some, some statistics of, of what we were dealing with here. So the, the molecular function ontology, almost 9,000 different, different terms here that, that could be predicted, uh, almost 19,000 in the, in the biological process ontology. Uh, the whole tree reaches down to a level of at most five, and you have on average six leaves, uh, six ch children per, per term. Uh, yeah, so again, as I said, maximum level of five and uh, around six, six children for, for each term, as, as, you, as you can see here. Uh, then you have to obviously come up with the proteins that you want to predict. So you, know, you have to find targets that all the methods that, uh, that are out there predict and that do not have annotations currently, but uh, will soon have. So this is then one, one little question to you again. So the following problem from each Kafka competitor, we want predictions of proteins which are not annotated right now, but will have annotations in four months. So this is basically the time that the, that the evaluation, final evaluation meeting will, will take place. And that suffice to uh, so as to establish statistical significance, so you basically need quite a quite a few of them. And qu question to you: How how would you do that? I give you a, a, a couple of minutes, two minutes. So how how did how did Casp do it? Do you know? You all know Casp, right? Yeah. Yeah, they. Oh. I think they like just asked around on different experimental labs to to tell them what they gonna publish. In yeah. True. Some yeah. Months. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the the problem with 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 function prediction is that that, that there are way too many labs for them. So you can think of structure as, as, one, as one function, but now we have, I don't know, thousands of functions. So that's, that's not an option here. So what, what else could you do? What, what else would be a, a, a cheap way? You could ask uh, uh, some journals which publish such results, if they got like papers in and they can yeah. hold it back. <laughs> for four months and then we could yeah. I don't know. This this might conflict with the with the authors. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so
So, no idea? You could just yeah. pay someone. To do no, 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 no. no. <laughs> All right. Um, so, 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 so basically, the trick is simply to wait long enough and to make enough predictions. So, uh, what what we uh, require from every competitor in 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 Kafka is to is to make predictions for the entire un, un, un annotated part of Swissprod. So, uh, and in in a few model model organisms. So, 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 so for example, humans. So, this, this, those were about fifty thousand proteins. So, all the so all the uh, competitors made predictions for around 50,000 proteins. And then you, then you simply wait. And uh, if, you're, if you're lucky, then after a, a couple of months, some of these proteins will have ex experimental annotations, and then you can assess these, these annotations. But this is basically just, just brute, brute force and doesn't cost any money at all. And um, uh, yeah, of course you have to make sure that that the that the proteins that come in really do are are not annotated at some certain uh, at, at at the point that you submit your prediction. And in order to make sure of that, that you you, you simply uh, filter out all the annotations that are already present in in any other database that is out there. So SwissProt, Go A project from the EBI and the and the Go consortium itself. All right. So uh, you know. All right. So this is uh, a sort of sch schematic view and a comparison to the to to another evaluation principle that that you learned in one of the last lectures. So for the for so for, for example for the assessment of the accuracy of en enzymatic activity predictions, you simply would take the entire Swiss plot and boil it down to a unique subset and then use this unique subset to make uh, unbiased predictions uh, with, with, the, with the entire rest of SwissProt as, as templates and in, in this case we simply do not perform any sort of sequence redundancy reduction but only take really the brand new proteins and this, this sort of simulates then so how, how well could uh, computationally, computational biology do in comparison with really these these wet lab experiments that came in in these couple of months that were between the submission time and the uh, evaluation meeting. All right. So again, uh, so time time passed for so, and after four months, uh, 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 proteins really so some of the proteins, some of the fifty thousand proteins that uh, really really. Uh, got annot annotations, so here are some statistics about these proteins. So a lot of proteins came actually from from from, from human, some from yeast, mouse, and and uh, and a few others. Um, evidence codes that were used, so inferred from um, uh, Interaction. This is this is this is what, 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 what this means. I believe from 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 mutant phenotype also a lot of and from inferred from 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 direct assay, which means basically a, some sort of of any sort of wet lab ex experiment. Again, it is quite quite simple to the over uh, quite similar to the overall distribution that you have also in the entire SwissPro database. Um, Leaves for proteins. So, so leaves basically are the the go terms that are most the the most specific description of the of the of the functions of a protein. The the number of leaves also indicates the how many different functions a protein has. Um, again, most most proteins uh, are only annotated with with one function, which is rather a, a, a limit of of our Ex 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 experiments um, rather than actual re reality, but still, so the the distributions again were were, were quite similar between the whole Swiss Prod and and our Kafka targets. Um, the most frequent leaves here for 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 MFO, so protein binding, obviously. So almost virtually all proteins bind something. 
So we have protein binding here as a, as a, as a very common, common term. Many, many proteins also uh, bind to themselves in order to perform their respective functions. So you have homodimerization activity a, a lot and also zinc ion binding as, as, as a frequent term. Uh, and finally for, for BPO, cell adhesion, so cells uh, accumulating and, and also functions in, in, uh, in basically tran transcription and translation are, are quite common. Although obviously this picture looks a lot different from this one because protein binding is not a thing in the biological process. And uh, an another very interesting statistic is really the, the sequence identity of each target to known proteins. So this, this also corresponds to basically the, the difficulty of the prediction. Um, and uh, so, so this is a quite a, quite a typical uh, distribution that you see from incoming experimental annotations. Uh, you see some, some, some sort of, of, of bias to, to already annot uh, annotated proteins. And uh, yeah, so this, this, is, uh, so this again is, is quite, quite suitable for, 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 for assessments because you have still a large body of, of proteins here in the, in the middle. But uh, it, is, it is also the case that it's uh, not quite the distribution you get for an unannotated proteins. So if we would uh, simply take the proteins that did not get any experimental an annotations in these couple of months, this part here would sort of dis disappear. Mm, yes. All right. So any, any questions about this so far? Um, then finally, uh, last step before the before the actual uh, assessment uh, evaluation measures, which was exactly the same thing that I that I ex explained for 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 our methods uh, in the beginning, and this is not a coincidence because we were really uh, we were also collaborating with the organizers of of CAFA and and already look, looking looking out to to make. Our assessment similar to theirs. Uh, so again, you simply take the average over different recall precision curves cal calculated individually for, for for each protein, and you boil it all down to one one final score called the maximum F1 score. And last but not least, we get to the final uh, evaluations. You have again some some statistics about what what the methods actually did that competed in the in the CAFA experiments. So many of them used sequences and machine learning based tools. Some also used sequ sequence profiles, uh, literature mining of course. So even though we made sure that no protein was annotated in any of the of the, uh, of the databases, that was not that this did not mean that some targets did not already have. Uh, pu uh, uh, publications that were describing what they what they were doing. Um, protein interactions, of, of course, interactions give you clues about protein function and gene expression as well. Um, a, a couple of, of rules for 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 each competitor. So only each competitor only was allowed to to submit one model. All the different tools were uh, evaluated differently. For uh, so there was one uh, evaluate, one separate evaluation for each ontology. You had uh, uh, no measures perfect, which means, which means you had a, a lot of different measures as well. So not not only this this uh, recall position measure that, that I showed here. So this was the flagship measure, but of course you you can already think of a lot of different measures. So the results that I will show here, so they, they actually quite also depend on the measure that is, that, that is used. Um, of course, implementation code uh, has to be um, audited, uh, curated uh, in, an, in, an, in, an, in an open fashion. A lot of money depends on the results. So, so all the all the groups that uh, that, particip that participated obviously had some some sort of funding agency in the background, which would then decide whether new money would would flow or not. 
depending on the uh, on the result of the classifiers, which were, which is why the identities of, of all groups are hidden. But I will show you the so I will reveal the identities for the for, for the for the best predictors in the end. And finally, you compared uh, it, there, was, there was a comparison similar to the one that we did with with with, with, a, with a method called called priors, which simply assigns. Uh, scores to each co-term based on the frequency in the whole genotology and also a very simple blast transfer uh, blast annot uh, annotation transfer that I was des describing in the in the very beginning uh, which simply simply takes the the first bested yeah so as as our only model we chose uh, the one from group a uh, which only calculated the the two scores. Uh, it performed average in MFO, but uh, quite quite good in the BPO on, 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 on ontology. For for CCO there was there was no experiment by the way because uh, it, it was so it was uh, there were there was there were some problems with the with the with the methods and it was commonly assumed that very different methods would be necessary for CCO predictions. So this was basically left left out in in the, in the first Kafka experiment, at least. Uh, nevertheless, so our, our method, as I said, performed quite well in the BPO uh, ontology, and especially for for difficult targets. So for for tar targets that have only a very low sequence identity, for proteins that uh, are two proteins that are already annotated. And if you really if you imagine that you're really competing in, against the best in the world, it is quite, quite stunning that uh, a method implemented by students in a couple of months can actually compete with them, or, or even perform better. Uh, again, uh, as I explained, the, the maximum F, F1 score, so is the, the, the score is a little bit biased towards the region around 0.5, so it is much much easier to reach a, a high F1 score if you if you're good in rye in, 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 in high recall regions than it is in low recall regions, which is also why we, we drop a little bit here. But still, it is quite a, quite a good result. And uh, yeah, to to wrap it up. Um, uh, we have some 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 insights from the from the from the top performing methods. So all the top performing methods were were in fact sequence based. So we were definitely on the right track here. Um, so Jones Jones UCL. This is from 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 University College London. You have a method called Panzer, which is developed by by a, a Swedish lab in Argo I believe, in Italy. Uh, and as I said, so they were they all relied have very heavily on on sequences. Uh, finally, go struct, which is this point right here, also sequence only. And uh, the really the the the, the, the most uh, <coughs> striking quote came from the from the from the, from the top performing methods. So Jones, Jones UCL, which which is this blue blue one here, I believe. That we that 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 high throughput data, like like uh, models of uh, of the structures of proteins, expression, gene gene expression, uh, large scale interaction scans, really really did not contribute a lot to to the to the function prediction, but it, it was really the sequences that. That made a difference. Uh, yeah, and 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 also uh, the the assessors in the end then tried to come up with with some sort of consensus method, and this consensus consensus method performed quite a quite a lot better than all the methods individually, indicating a large room for improvement. Okay, and uh, yeah, I think I will conclude here and go on uh, with what happened afterwards next time. Thank you.